Okay, guys, welcome back to the channel. About to head out to Munich, but I wanted to get this one video in the hopper. It was a special request based on the video I did on these Via Blue vibration footers. And if you recall in that video, I had good success with this helping a resonance I was noticing in a frequency sweep with just this one speaker. And if you watched that video, I was not overly effusive. I found something that worked that was very economical. I talked about other things. I talked about some do-it-yourself things you could do. Um, and again, it's very variable on what's going to work for you and your situation and your products. Vibrations are very difficult to predict other than if you have like the facilities that Magico has. Uh, so what I wanted to, what, what he, this guy did was he said he tested it with his one bookshelf and four or five bookshelf speaker and four or five products similar to this, not even the ones I was talking about, and claimed that, uh, yeah, he measured maybe a small difference, but nothing that would be audible. So he says, you know, I'm, I'm full of it <laughs> when, I, when I'm talking about what happened here. So what I wanted to do was address it. Again, none of these guys intimidate me. I've been in the hobby long enough. I deal with a rocket scientist weekly, several times a week, Edgar at Princeton. Uh, if anybody's going to intimidate me, it'd be him. Uh, but anyway, he, I looked at his testing method. He did one bookshelf. And he did four or five products and it made these conclusions that wouldn't even pass any kind of AES peer review, which Edgar has got tons of AES pep papers. You know, he's very thorough with his conclusions. But in any case, uh, getting back to this, uh, I'm not going to call out the guy by name because he does serve the purpose, the industry in some purposes. And again, it's not, I'm not here in a pissing contest, but I will break it down a little bit more from three different angles, what I wanted to do. First of all, I wanted to show other people that are even more in tune with vibration control and speaker building than me, what they have seen. People that also make vibration control products, what they have seen. And then do some primitive experiments here to just show you, relatively speaking, some things. And then I actually took some measurements of this speaker. The good thing about the Bach is it does three frequency sweeps, run one right after the other with each speaker. So I was able to record three separate ones with and without the footers on. And I was able to, with three samples, not just one AB, a common denominator in with and without the footers would have changed. And so I'll put up that screenshot at the end uh, of this video. And I'll probably do a part two where I can walk you through in more detail because it's Inevitably, people are going to say, wow, how would you do this test? How would you do this? Where's the recording? So I'll put all that in another video. But, you know, again, sometimes no matter what you do, <laughs> it's not going to convince the people. But for those interested, <clears throat> this should be an interesting video. Because let's break it down, first of all, with the fact that this person tested one bookshelf speaker as his control and assumes that all speakers are pretty much inert, which is the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, uh, I just spent time with Andrew Jones, and this wasn't captured on camera or even the interview that Steve and I did, but we spent a, quite a bit of time talking about Andrew's experience with KEF and all the facilities they had working on cabinet resonances, cabinet uh, vibrations, and even the stands. And they talked about with the source point. Steve fills it with cat litter, and uh, uh, Andrew actually recommends this foam fill stuff that can get in there a little bit easier uh, if you don't have a funnel to get the cat litter in there. And, you know, he was talking about how a lot of it's just intuitive. You know that this thing rings. Um, you don't even need to do certain measurements, but they've done testing over the years. And there has been <laughs> improvements over the years with speaker design to improve the vibrations uh, and the resonances. So to say that all speakers are inert and that none of them can benefit from what's underneath them, which actually becomes part of the structure, is sheer folly. But again, there's other people that have done it as well. The Magico has the vibrometer type uh, testing equipment that can predict at different volumes. Because again, certain if you don't run the test tones at a certain volume, it may not excite a resonance that you can hear uh, or the test equipment picks up as well. But the stuff that Magico was doing, I made a point to ask them about this. You don't have to do different volume levels to test resonances with their cabinet. Their test equipment can extrapolate that. And if you watch really closely in that Magico tour video, there was another speaker they were benchmarking the baffle to. And it was a baffle from a very high end manufacturer with tons of resources for manufacturing their equipment. They're one of the known as one of the biggest 
brands for using science and technology in building their speakers. And even they were showing, the vibrometer was showing how their baffle does flex uh, and have more resonant capabilities than the Magico. So to say that all speakers are the same and none can benefit from vibration control or any th kind of additions is, again, sheer folly based on people that are in the industry. But then even with vibration control products, if you look at Norman Varney, now I haven't talked about his stuff, I haven't even tried it yet, but he gave a very convincing demonstration at Exponent. If you watch that video, maybe I'll put up a screenshot, you can look up that video, uh, where he used a little music player and put it on the table and it played music. Then he put it on top of his vibration control. Just very, just one difference in the surface that it was playing on changed the resonant characteristics of that music player. Um, you can't get much more proof than that, that the surface that some mechanical device is on can change the resonant characteristics. So again, intuition, experience, all these people, that's part one of what I wanted to get out the way. People smarter than me, I've already tested this and spent a lot of time on this to show even through intuition you're, that they, you're, if you have an IQ over room temperature, you should be able to figure that part out. But if you're still like, well, do these things really make a difference? Um, and so can you prove that they make a difference? Well, I'm going to get to that with the measurements on top of the subjective stuff I already talked about. But I thought I'd do a more grandiose experiment here just to show you guys um, a little bit easier on video. So I took an aluminum lid, uh, piece of equipment lid here. And a lot of speakers are made of aluminum now. But as we showed in the Magico video, they resonate. Unless you put constraint layer dampening, bracing, all the things. Obviously, this is a thin sheet. I'm doing this for demonstration purposes. Uh, yes, a speaker will have less resonances than this, hopefully so. Uh, but it still doesn't negate all resonances. So what I wanted to show you is, let me get a little mallet here. Um, depending on what surface you put this on, it will resonate differently. So I'm putting it on my knee. And you hear that. If I put it on one of these pucks, these are ones that you put under your air conditioner or dryer. You can buy them. That's what they're meant for, but you can use them on your speakers too. This, man, this is the best A-B test of all. I can go out to my uh, air condition. When I put these under that, it stopped the resonance with that fan that was um, triggering a resonance in the cabinet of my air condition right off the bat. A-B is so different with that. But on speakers even or you know aluminum it's going to change the, the resonant characteristic but also one thing to talk about is spikes i don't i can't put a spike on this but if you just put one point down on my knee like it is now it changes the resonant characteristic too and this is one reason why i'm not a huge fan of spikes although it does change the resonant characteristic of the piece uh it's kind of sheer folly to think that the vibrations just know where to go, go down, none come back up. And in many cases, when you put it on a point, uh, you are actually increasing the ringing afterwards. You change the frequency, obviously, but you also can change the ringing. And what I have found probably related to most audible resonances, because it usually gets up in volume and certain parts of certain songs, even frequency was responses sweeps don't always trigger it because sometimes it's the harmonic structure of the music and the volume and the pressurization of the room all combined that trigger a resonance either in your speaker something uh, rattling in your room you know how difficult it is when you bring your car to a dealership to tell them about a rattle how to reproduce it is very difficult billy eilish bad guy triggers a lot more resonances than others but frequency wise it has the same frequencies as other music it's, it's, again, a much more difficult equation to always predict. So that's why I said in my video, you can't just guarantee one or the other. But I do like, I'll show you, the wide pods. Because just like I showed on my knee here versus on a point, the more surface area you get, um, I found it can help dissipate vibrations, which are much more magnanimous, if that's the proper way to say it, uh, with speakers. They create quite a bit of vibrations. And so the more surface area you have that is have some kind of dampening characteristic, I find better than spikes. Uh, in fact, 
counts in size, make platforms are my favorite. And I would take any footers you have under your speakers off and let everything, the most surface area possible, sit on those platforms uh, that ha are d basically damped and d dissipate much more effectively, in my opinion, than spikes. And heck, good friend, Steve McCormick, he invented spikes. Everybody that has spike footers, they all come derivative from him inventing it in the first place. But he'll even tell you it's not meant to dissipate vibrations per se, um, and vibration can certainly come back up, but it changes the resonant characteristic, and at the time, it was kind of innovative. But he uses much more sophisticated vibration control now. He doesn't even use those tiptoes. So again, using spikes, and you know, look, if uh, you want spikes, Via Blue makes them really attractive. Um, in some cases, it may be good to go into carpet, uh, if the, but in a lot of cases, putting your speakers flat on carpet actually helps dampen the vibrations better than putting them on spikes. But in any case, the point is, there's lots of products out there and you have to try what works. And you can start very economically with some of the do-it-yourself things that I started my channel on that I showed you, uh, Vibropods with double yellow squash balls. Uh, these things are very well made and uh, economical and attractive. Uh, spikes, if you wanna try that. There's lots of options that you don't have to spend a fortune on that work. And so that was my point of my video. And again, this is just an experiment to show the different resonant characteristics. Because once you hear this ringing, building up is what I, I have come to learn is what really excites the resonances. It's the impulses themselves aren't something you can damp out. Uh, you can damp a little bit of it, but you know, you stomp your foot on the floor, it's still gonna be felt throughout most equipment. But what you don't want is that ringing afterward. Like if I put this on a point, that ringing, because with music, you're constantly getting pulse, pulse, pulse. So if the ringing builds up, builds up, builds up, then you have, and you have songs like Billy Eilish's Bad Guy that are triggering this harmonic structure that'll make some of your pictures rattle or excite a resonance in your speaker. Uh, that's the problem. So you want something that will dissipate uh, those vibrations and you never can get 100%. I don't think there's a perfect speaker, perfectly inert speaker yet, but there are some that are certainly much better than others. And if you don't have one of those perfect speakers, which often costs a lot of money to put into the cabinet, then the surface that it interfaces it with, as I've shown here, it, it changes depending on how it interfaces with the floor and whatever you have underneath it. Now, what I'm gonna do is stop here because I'm going to do screen recording to explain in more detail. But what I did was, as I mentioned, filmed uh, the, the frequency sweep, uh, but I had to put the mic pretty close to the speaker to try to capture that resonance that I heard. And again, it's just one speaker, which again shows you it could be just the location of this speaker on this part of the floor over here and the pressurization of the room. Or maybe I constructed this one a little bit different than that one. The glue is not as good or the construction may not be quite as good in this one versus that one. This is a very non-resonant speaker to begin with. Not a lot of problems, but only in this area is there a little less bracing than other places. And this is where I kind of, and then there's a big cutout on this side. So this is kind of the weakest area and that the, kind of the area where I was hearing the resonance. And so on just one speaker, but I tried to record the frequency sweep, but the problem was you have to get it above a certain volume to even trigger that audible resonance. So getting a mic close to the speaker at loud volume tends to overload things. So I had to peel things back. But then what I did is said, okay, it's not very audible by the recording, but I put the recording through a spectral analyzer, and then that's how I was able to see a common thread of with the, the uh, footers that I have, the Via Blue, and without, what was the main difference? And again, it's slight, but you'll be able to see it at least in the measurements. I'll put up those screenshots at the end to give you a teaser, and then when I come back from Munich and finish all those videos, I'll try to do a follow-up video where I'll walk you through, and I'll even put the recordings up there um, and you'll have the website where I use the spectral analyzer. Again, this may not convince anybody, but I thought it was worthwhile to do a little deeper dive to show you that resonances do make a difference. They are audible. What you put your speakers on can make a difference. Not all the time, not at every volume, not on every song, but it can make a difference. Uh, this has been proven. Um, it can be measured. It's something that 
you don't need to spend a lot of money on, but something, if you're in the high-end industry and you're an audiophile, something you may want to look at in the future. So hopefully you enjoyed this content. Stay tuned for part two and a lot coming from Munich. So see you guys soon.